I'm Lois Perry. I am chapter chair of SCORE Orlando, and I'm very glad to, to welcome all of you to our joint webinar with the Central Florida International Trade Office with Chris uh, Leggett this morning. Chris and I both share offices at the National Entrepreneur Center. Uh, you probably hear I'm a Southern girl and I see I got the hands going. I, I talk with my hands. I'll try to keep them down here. That can be distracting. But um, the, the uh, 32nd um, uh, score uh, info is we are an affiliate of the SPA. We are boots on ground. We do uh, mentoring. You can come in and talk to a uh, mentor one-on-one. -on -one. We do phone appointments, we do Zoom appointments. I mean, however we can, can help you, we're here. The second arm of our offerings are the webinars. And as I was saying earlier, we're getting just hundreds of people coming in through our webinars. We'll probably train uh, or provide 11,000 to 12,000 uh, sessions of webinars during our fiscal year this year. So that says to us that folks are adapted to it. When we occasionally do a live one, we find that we get very few people in because society is telling us we can do just as good on Zoom. So that's that's what we're doing here. If you want to interact with everyone, let's do that in chat. Tell us where you're from. Uh, let's see, we've got Charlotte, North Carolina. I think that's our farthest so far, but that's not that far. We usually have folks coming in from all over the country. Oh, Cleveland, uh, that's a little bit farther. I'll be coming up to, the, to that neck of the woods in a couple of weeks to see family. Julie Oda, glad you're here, but not the prize for the farthest. You live out here near Chris and, and myself. That's right. Miami, uh, glad you're here. When you have a specific question, let's put that in the Q&A so we don't miss it in all the networking in the, the chat. With uh, We are recording within, uh, let's see, what is today? Tuesday, probably by the end of the week, you will get, receive an email back to the email that you registered with, with a copy of um, this recording. And Chris, I know you usually like to go out after the fact and uh, send the decks out. So folks have that, is that correct? So right. you'll get a lot of, of tools to, to work with. Um, so that's what I've got. If you have any questions, put them in Q&A and I'm going to come off screen to allow more bandwidth. And let me turn it over to my dear friend, Chris Leggett our uh, manager of the Central Florida International Trade Office, who is a wealth of information. And you take it from here, Chris. Thanks so much, Lois. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm always happy to see so many people interested in growing their business through international trade. Uh, it really is both in terms of importing and exporting an important tool for any small business or entrepreneur who's looking to take their business to the next level, or it might be your entire business model is around uh, importing and exporting. And that's what CFITO is here to help with. Uh, we were established in 2014 with a mandate to help businesses to grow through importing and exporting. And that's one of the things uh, actually that makes us a little bit different than some of the other public resources is that we can help uh, people with importing because we recognize that importing is not just exporting jobs. It might be that imported component that's gonna make your product competitive. Uh, it could be that a product is only available uh, outside the United States. And uh, that is bringing dollars and jobs into our local economy. And we are here to help by providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, educational outreach like we're doing today. I'll go and talk to anyone uh, uh, who wants uh, different organizations. I'll be speaking with the Puerto Rican Chamber about uh, international trade on Thursday. Uh, so really, uh, I'm here as an international trade evangelist uh, to help uh, bring the good news message to uh, all the companies uh, in Central Florida. And uh, with that, uh, I'll start talking a little bit about this uh, webinar. Uh, in addition to what Lois said, uh, we'll also post the recording of the webinar on the CFITO YouTube channel 
uh, by the end of the week. And as Lois said, uh, you'll get copies of the presentations uh, afterwards, so you don't have to worry about catching every single thing uh, in in your notes. Uh, we'll we'll make it easy for you to be able to follow up, as well as follow up with our speakers. Uh, I'll send you the contact details for all of our speakers shortly after the webinar. Uh, so first today, we're going to hear from Kim Kirkendall on how to identify a reliable supplier and effectively manage your relationship with them. Uh, Kim has over 30 years experience in international business. She began her career by moving to China in 1986, ran factories and developed supply chains throughout Asia. She's currently the president of International Resource Development Inc., where she consults with companies to develop, expand, or improve their operations in Asia. And she hosts the incredible International Trade Resources podcast, which features industry experts focused on how-to information the companies need for cross-border trade. Then Joe Binsack will share his insights on how to get your merchandise from seller to your business. Joe has over 18 years of experience in the logistics and transportation industry, in particular in warehousing and distribution with operations consisting of over 52 locations across the country, as well as with domestic modes of shipping such as air, trucking, intermodal and time sensitive shipments. His responsibilities range from sales and operational management in various roles of the logistics industry. He's partnered with colleagues in global shipping such as customs brokers, freight forwarders, shipping lines, and ocean carriers to meet the overall needs of his clients. And Joe is a proud board member of the Jacks Chamber Transportation and Logistics Council of Jacksonville, Florida. Finally, Linda Dick will go into a deeper dive about what happens at the border and how to successfully get your goods through customs. Linda is a licensed US customs broker and qualified Canadian customs broker with strong global trade compliance knowledge and an extensive background in domestic and international supply chain management. She has a proven history of driving robust international trade programs to ensure an uninterrupted supply chain with forward thinking solutions. Linda leads the Customs Compliance and Consulting Division for R&L Global Logistics as director and helps many companies, both small and large, understand the requirements of importing and minimizing these costs. But just a reminder, if you could put any questions you have into the Q&A box, uh, we will get to those at the end of the three presentations. And with that, uh, thanks to all our speakers and over to you, Kim. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen here and then we're gonna get started because we uh, only have so much time and I like to give you as much as humanly possible in that time frame. So, uh, we're going to talk about importing. I'm, I'm the generalist, you know, get you introduced to the topic and then um, we'll hand it off on the shipping and logistics side. So up in the top right, you see our podcast information. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcast, or you can go directly to our Buzzsprout link, which I sent you in there. We also have YouTube videos. I just put a link on and training classes, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, so imports 101, one of the things I think a lot of us in the advisory business run into is that companies will say, I'm not an importer. I'm just buying a few cartons of product from India or China or Mexico, but I'm not an importer. And we'd like to tell you, yes, you are. You are an importer. Even if you just buy one box a year, you're an importer. So as soon as you start bringing things out of another country into the United States, you become an importer, okay? That means more documents, more agencies, and more risk. So you need to be aware of what importing is and how it works and what's important for you. It doesn't need to be difficult, but like a lot of professional things, there's a terminology to it that, that's important to understand. So as an example, when a shipment leaves a factory, we're gonna use China here as an example. There are documents that are needed by the shipping company to know who's it going to, how's it being shipped, documents needed from Ch for Chinese customs, what's leaving the country, does it, does it comply with all their regulations, and what if it's going to be potentially taxed as an export or controlled as an export, how do they do that? Documents for US customs so that when it's coming into the country in the United States, U.S. customs can, and authorities can say, okay, this is the duty and tax on this product. 
or it should be, uh, it's regulated because it's a food item or a medical item and it should be regulated. The bank uses these documents to make payments. Who are the payments going to and from? And there are some other stakeholders too. So the documents are very important. They clarify when does the ownership transfer? When do the goods stop belonging to the factory and start belonging to you? Who is paying for this shipment and for the goods themselves? And when are they making the payment? What's inside the cartons? Where is the shipment going? Who's the responsible party in the US for importing it? Because there has to be a responsible party. Some of this information is also on the outside of the carton. So that's another important thing we don't want you to forget about. So I'm gonna introduce some of the key documents here. Um, commercial invoice. This is really, I want you to think of this as, a, as one of the most important legal documents in a shipment because it says, you know, all of the parties that are involved, the product that's inside. You can see the example on the right. This HS code is the universally, internationally accepted code to, so that everyone can be clear that this is a travel mug because we might use a different term for that in the U.S. than they use for it in China or Australia. So there are these codes that make it clear. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. The pro forma invoice is a preliminary invoice before the shipment. And I've seen too many companies that only have a pro forma invoice for a payment that they made for uh, tooling or something. They don't have a final official commercial invoice. So those pro forma invoices have their place, but you really wanna be looking for a final commercial invoice. The packing list is the list of goods that go into the cartons. That's important. You may need a country of origin certificate, depending on what type of product it is or what you ask of your supplier that states where the materials are coming from, where the goods are coming from. There's a freight invoice, a cargo receipt. My colleagues will talk a little bit more about that later. You have a bill of lading. That's a document that says, you know, the details of the actual shipment itself, an airway bill. There may be a hazard declaration. So there's a lot of paperwork involved in this that we want you to think about. And then the terminology, you know, INCO terms. I'm going to talk a little bit about on the next slide. These HS codes I introduced. You'll often hear of MOQ, the factory's minimum order quantity. We have a good video on that on our YouTube channel. You know, who's the importer of record? That's the person responsible for imports. So you want to make sure that you're designating that. Um, the consignee. You may ship the goods, you may be the company purchasing the goods, but you may ship them to another warehouse or to your customer, and they may be the consignee. So these are all terms you want to be comfortable with. What's a courier shipment? That's something like DHL or FedEx, a freight forwarder. We have on our call today, freight forwarder, a speaker for you. I like to call them a travel agent for your shipment, right? They arrange for all the details of your shipment. Customs broker, something else you're going to learn more about today, manages those important export transactions for you. Drayage is a term that you might hear, especially if it shows up as a fee on your freight, the invoice from the freight forwarder. This means transportation and or or warehousing that's happening within the um, within the ports. And then the cube, you need to be able to calculate the volume and the size of your, of your packages, because that's really important for the, the shipping companies to understand how much they can put into a container, how much they can put into an airplane, right? So these INCO terms, we really don't have the time to go into real detail, but they're three letter codes and they're, uh, again set from an international perspective, but it's always a good idea when you choose one that applies to your shipment, which is who's paying for the freight, at what point who's paying for the insurance, you know, that sort of thing. That's what they tell us. It's important that you clarify um, some additional information in your, in your purchase order or commercial invoice so that it's clear where, if it's free on board, where is it? Where does that transfer happen? At the factory? Where's the factory? At the port? So those are all things you want to be clear about. Because while in theory, there's an international understanding for what these terms mean, I've still seen variances in practice by how people use them at different factories and businesses around the world. So you want to be clear. What is your HS or HTS code? They do have a slightly different meaning, but you'll see them used often interchangeably. This is that number I told you about, so that when I'm shipping over 
you know, coffee in this, ex in this example, everybody's really clear on what type of coffee it is that I'm shipping. So you have the first two digits, or it's like the Dewey Decimal System in the library, right? The first two digits are coffee, tea, and mate, so like a big category. And then when we add 0901, we're specifically talking about coffee that is, um, you know, coffee husks and skins. It's not decaffeinated coffee. Then we go a little bit more detail and we say specifically coffee roasted, not decaffeinated. So we've eliminated husks and skins and some substitutes. So we're getting narrower as we go down, right? And so in the end, you end up with these 10 digits. The last four can vary by country. And that's as much as I can say about this at this point, but you know, the in a, importing classes we have go into more detail. If you want to understand what applies to the product that you're importing, the US ITC, International Trade Commission, has a fabulous search engine on their website where you can put in that number and you can identify what are the duties for this product. You'll see where I circled in red on the right. The column on your left has the general duty. So it might be 0.7%. If there's a number after the slash, that means there's an additional control, quotas or tariffs. The second column where it says special, that's if we have a free trade agreement with that country. That means that the duty rate on the left is typically going to be free, so there's no duty. On the, th the third column, which is under number two, I call that the countries we hate, right? Those are the countries that we penalize. And right now that includes like North Korea and those type of countries. It's a small list, but those are countries that if you import goods from those countries, it's gonna be a much higher duty rate than what would be normal. So if you look a few lines down, you see a 3.7%, you see uh, free and a bunch of codes for Australia, Korea, Mexico, those are all countries we have free trade agreements. And on the far right, you see 35%, which is that penalty amount that probably is not going to apply to you because I doubt you're going to be importing from those companies, countries. So we're going to talk about suppliers a little bit now. But before you find a supplier, you need to prepare yourself. I want you to document your product. And again, in the training class, we have a lot of information about that. Because if you're not being clear about you, what you want, they can't be, they're not necessarily going to be correct in what they send you. You want to know what quantities you're going to be ordering, because that's important to meet the supplier's MOQ and also to get pricing and quotes from them. And be, be reasonable. Don't give them the highest quantity that you probably will order six months or a year from now. You need to be reasonable about, we're going to start at 500 pieces, go to 5,000, go to 10,000 as the business progresses, right? Does your production require some tooling or other investments that you might need to make? That's important to be thinking about in advance because that's part of what you need to communicate with your supplier. Is your product regulated by the US? I received a call a couple of weeks ago from a small startup company two years into developing this product. And I said to her, you realize your product is FDA regulated. You know, you have to, to it's a, fundamentally a medical device. And her answer was, I just realized recently. So in all of this development, she has not followed FDA standards and documented her, her design and development process the way she needed to. So it's important that you understand that upfront, right? What labeling is required? Because you're gonna have to give the supplier uh, a template of your label. What needs to be a label on the product? And there also may be label requirements on the cartons. How are you gonna ship your product? Because that may affect the packaging. Is it going air freight? Is it going courier? Is it going ocean? You may have different cartons or different packaging because of that. What instructions do you need to tell the supplier about packaging? Is it a fragile item? Do you want it to be packed in a certain way so that it doesn't break? Does it need to stay at a certain temperature? Um, do you need to have certain carton markings because the boxes always need to sit upright? Those are the kinds of things I want you to talk about. Now, you're going to find a supplier. Many people are using these online services, Alibaba. You can, you can also contact trading companies or agents to work with you. When you're on these websites, there's a lot of tools for you. So there's a way for you to identify on the left, is this a company that's been verified? 
Um, do they have inventory in stock? So the product is ready to ship. Do they have a minimum order quantity? You know, if you put in your order quantity, is it going to be acceptable? Do you want to limit your suppliers to particular regions? Do you want them to have some kind of regulatory certification, ISO or other certifications that apply to your market? So those are all things that we see in the columns on the left. When you look at the supplier information on the right, You'll see uh, red. the red circle is whether this is a sponsored listing, meaning the company has paid for this to show up at the top of the search engine. Blue is if they have been independently verified. Green is the ratings by customers. And then yellow is what their response rate is. And we encourage you to, to dig in, and we have a couple of YouTube videos on this, to dig in deeper and see if this is really a manufacturer or is it a trading company? Does it look appear legitimate to me. If they say that they're manufacturing sports towels and also metal water bottles, that's probably not likely because the equipment and the raw materials for towels and metal water bottles are completely different. And I can't imagine the same factory manufacturing those two products. So possibly they're actually a trading company rather than a manufacturer. And that's not a bad thing. It's just something you want to understand in advance, right? So as far as managing your supplier, this is a partnership. It's not a win-lose situation. You don't want to look at negotiation like you're trying to get more out of them because that's not how you go into a good partnership. Secondly, if you're not clearly stating what you want, you won't get it. The more details you provide, the less risk you have of poor quality. And I can't state that often enough. I have $500 million, billion dollar clients come to me and complain the factory got the packaging wrong or the factory didn't do this right. And we take a look at the, the communication that the American company had with the factory and they're not being clear about what it is they want. They tell the factory, we want the quality of boxes similar you sell to your other clients. What does that mean, right? That's not clear enough. I want you to be really clear. You wanna ask them for item details. We recently had a company come to us from Australia that was having products made in China and they wanted to start a new product and they asked for pricing and they got quotes that they wanted, but they were asking for quotes that included wool material in this product. And the, the person I had worked with them in China said to them, that's not wool, it's felted wool which is a term that's used to mean primarily cotton and other fibers. It's not actually 100% wool. They had spent months getting quotes and didn't realize that. So you want to ask your supplier for detail. Give me the material content. Send me samples. Tell me what tests apply to this product. You're going to want to have a contract, a purchase order, the final commercial invoice, all of those things to document your ownership of the goods, the intellectual property. If I've had companies come to me who've sent $20,000 over for tooling to China and all they have is a pro forma invoice. They don't have a contract saying that they own the tooling. They sent the money to a, a, the Chinese company had a U.S. bank account so that in China, there's no evidence that they paid for the tooling. You need to be careful about all these details. Remember that if you change anything from their standard product or from the product you made previously, so you put on a different logo, you change the color, you change the shape or function, you want to get additional samples to approve that. And you need to update your documentation to make sure it reflects the new situation. It's always a good idea to use images when you're communicating across languages. So drawings, photographs, all those kinds of things are really important for you to make sure that you're truly getting all the information that you really need. Now, I talked earlier about our podcast, which I put into the chat link, our YouTube channel. Here's an example of a short video we have. We bring those up a couple every week. And then this is the series of classes that we have. We have a bundle on imports. We have a bundle on exports. We talk about your product, how you communicate about it, how you document it, 
how to find suppliers, all of that. And you'll see below, there's a discount code for my friends in Florida, because I love CFITO and SCORE. We work a lot with them. That brings the price of $750 for the bundle down to under $200. And your code is Import Florida. It's only good until July 4th. If you don't buy the classes by July 4th, the code isn't good anymore. So, and we ask you any questions you have for me at the end of this. I appreciate them very much. Um, sorry to be, you know, so rushed, but I know we've got two more fantastic speakers up and not a lot of time left. So thank you guys very much and on to the next presenter. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, I think uh, one thing that everyone is going to be learning, if you don't know it already, is that there are a lot of people available to help you uh, in importing. It's not something you have to do by yourself. Uh, there's uh, resources like Kim who can help you uh, find the right buyer, manage a relationship with the buyer. And then we've got people uh, like Joe who's uh, just coming up who are gonna help uh, move your products. Uh, and with that, I'll cede the floor to Joe. Thanks, Chris. Uh, well done, Kim. I don't know how I'm gonna follow that up, but I'm gonna try my very best. Uh, I'd like to start with a, uh, a simple slide. Uh, this is probably the, the most complicated I'll have in my presentation. Uh, and we're basically, my position is to help explain uh, the, the understanding of how shipments are managed and the difference in the conveyance of modes that are available to you as a, as a manufacturer, as a, as a shipper, uh, anywhere in the world. We here in the U.S. We we focus mainly on over the road, which is a flatbed dry van reefer or time sensitive type mode. Uh, we have rail, which is includes intermodal. We have air and ocean, which is uh, participates in the international side. But it's important that you start when you're in in the supply chain, which I put a small diagram showing how. You bring in your raw product, you start production, you have to figure out what type of com commodity and how it's going to be packaged that you're going to focus with on different clients or customers that you have. You have a time factor in which you need your product delivered. Where are your customers' locations that the customer or the customer's locations that your product has to be shipped to? That's very important. And the instructions for shipping and receiving such as loading and appointments. Um, th th all, the, all this criteria helps us as transportation professionals find you the best service, not just the lowest cost, but the best service. In today's marketplace, there are basically three types of transportation organizations. There's asset-based carriers that also participate in uh, warehousing and distribution. The 3PL, or otherwise known as three-party logistics, and then you have freight forwarders. They're the three basic uh, resources for transportation that uh, is known to ship product throughout the world. <clears throat> the difference between each really is not that complicated, but it plays an important role when you're helping identify the best path for you to select when you're resourcing your products. The asset base, they own their own equipment, they typically have their own warehouse uh, terminals for their trucks and their drivers. Uh, they can also participate in warehousing. Not, not every asset base has a warehouse, but they do utilize locations with partner carriers. Um, they offer what's, a, what's called a transportation management service or system. Uh, it's a platform that allows you to monitor your, your shipment throughout the country. <clears throat> And they, to complement that, they have a warehouse management system that uh, that helps you inventory-wise when you when you're trying to calculate what product needs to be refilled and, and procured. The three PL third-party logistics they act uh, for domestic and international locations throughout the world. Uh, they they're primarily designed to help manage on one or more facets for the procurement and fulfillment. It's a broad meaning, and it's very similar to the next component, which is the freight forwarders. Freight forwarders, they're operations that 
are very sophisticated. They focus on large volume product, uh, very large count uh, clients. Uh, they offer a, a, a wide range of services that support the logistics industry. Uh, all three of these play an important role. Usually you'll find that they will partner together. There's many times that you'll speak with one company that would be an asset-based trucking company and they'll be working with an, another entity like a freight forwarder or a third party logistics company. Now that we identify the different parties that represents the logistics industry, it's how do you qualify the best option for your needs? Will your product import export or will you remain domestic? And based on your production and manufacturing systems, will you be able to ship direct from your facility or will you need an overflow solution to accommodate a supply chain distribution? So that's one of the neat things about this, this opportunity that Chris offered is that I get to, to hear from so many people out there that are in different commodities and different markets. And if there's a way that we can help you and work with your uh, your freight forwarder, your customers broker, rather, um, their, your consignee, your client. That's what we're here to do. That's typically what logistics people do that handle the transportation. We try to coordinate between your facility, your product, and your end user. That's our job. There are only a few scenarios that apply to regular basis on having the flexibility to all supply chain procurement distribution systems. In conclusion, the shipping wheel, a well-ordered oiled shipping wheel, <laughs> working at maximum efficiency makes sense for three resources listed. It's really important that uh, you, you do a little homework or a lot of homework and, and meet with different organizations, whether it's locally or even if you participate in, in the Chamber of Commerce in your local area, they can usually refer to refer you to resources that can help you, uh, that are trustworthy, that are known for their service, because when it comes down to it, it's all relative to service. Um, it's when, when you when you produce a, a box of widgets or a pallet of widgets and you need to send them from Jacksonville, Florida to Miami or New York, we always look to see who the, the, the resource that best fits that lane, uh, best fits that service, uh, whether it's uh, time sensitive or whether it's a full truckload, whatever the case may be, we that's what our job is to, is to constantly monitor and keep the service high so that you never have to apologize to your customers. <clears throat> Not every freight forward or 3PL and asset-based carrier are the same. So focus on you and your business. Conduct an interview with each party and this way you'll know. Uh, referrals and how the best way to work in this vein. Um, we depend highly on referrals. It's a very competitive market and we try to do our best in every way we can to meet the, all the different types of commodities that we ship. It's not an easy thing, but we always accomplish uh, making it work. That's why we've been here for 21 years. So if you have any questions, the best thing is to email me or uh, contact me directly and I can help with anything individually because this is, uh, you can wear many hats in logistics. And today I'm wearing one big, huge hat just because of the time essence. <laughs> just, uh, I can help anybody or with any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Joe. Oh, there you are, okay. That's great. Uh, this was, again, another example of the services that are available. And I think one of the key things that uh, Joe said is you really want to interview uh, the person that uh, you're going to work with, uh, because at the end of the day, the, everybody provides a similar service. But uh, uh, when you work with someone who you are comfortable with, uh, who you know that if you have a problem that they're going to pick up the phone, that's really what you're looking for. 
uh, when you are finding a logistics company. And uh, as Joe said, there's lots of them around. So you really owe it to yourself to speak to a few to make sure you're getting somebody with the expertise uh, on the market, on the product that uh, uh, you're looking to import. And uh, then uh, that uh, is someone who you enjoy working with. Uh, uh, speaking to people I enjoy working with, the uh, next person coming up is Linda Dick, who uh, is going to talk about one of the most complicated uh, uh, parts of the importing process. And that is what happens at the border. So thank you, Linda. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I appreciate your kindness. Um, although it may be viewed as the most complicated, um, I've been doing it for so many years, it becomes um, uh, very simple to deliver. So sometimes I, I get a little carried away and I can make it complicated, but I don't mean to do so. So I tried to simplify this down for everyone. I um, uh, today I, I'm talking about the customs broker, what the role of the broker is, and uh, sorry, here's the agenda that I was going to talk about. What customs is, uh, importing, uh, the customs broker, what their role is, uh, customs bonds, how to register yourself as an importer, the power of attorney, and a brief overview of the documentation that's needed to import. So CBP, that's the acronym for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. If you see this badge show up at your doorstep, run really, very quickly. Just kidding. Uh, Customs is a different agency than the U.S. Border Patrol. Uh, we often hear Border Patrol units uh, on the news. Uh, they specifically patrol the borders, but CBP or Customs as we refer them to as a whole, they, they work to review and monitor imports and secure the borders and other items that are entered the country illegally. And, and they monitor this through all different modes of transportation like the other two had spoke about. Uh, you'll see on the news where where they caught counterfeit um, uh, merchandise at, let's say, the DHL hub in Cincinnati or the FedEx hub, or at the border, um, there are knockoffs of, uh, of uh, wearing apparel and handbags and such. So that's, that's how they monitor and they um, uh, review the information and the, these guys at all different kinds of levels are, are, very, are all very active in this process. So importing today has been going, has been happening for a long time, obviously, and it's a process filled with research and due diligence that takes up time. It's come a long way in its advancement and as customs learn more and, and society and the world's turns into a, a new direction as we know it today, there, there's a lot going on. And with that, the, the primary objective is to protect, protect ourselves. So when it comes to international trade, uh, one of the most important steps is actually clearing the goods with US customs. It can be complex, which is why many businesses turn to a customs broker to help them through this process. And finding a reputable customs broker requires a lot of research and due diligence. So what is a customs broker? The main purpose of the customs broker is preparing and clearing a customs entry. Uh, customs brokers work with an importer to ensure all goods within the shipment are legal and compliant with U.S. Customs. Uh, the customs broker receives training. They're certified by U.S. Customs in order to perform these duties. And as a result, they're well informed about the import process. A customs broker is basically an extension of U.S. Customs because they have obligations to fulfill of their own and they have obligations to uh, represent you in a legal way uh, with the entry of the goods into U.S. Customs. Um, so a customs broker obviously has some technical skills, has certification. So they charge clients based on the specific services that are needed. 
most of the common service services needed for bringing goods into the United States is a import security filing. That's for ocean shipments only. That was implemented back after 9-11 when uh, Homeland Security realized and understood that they didn't have the overall um, protection or advisement notification of goods coming into the country. So they implemented a security program that allows them to reject a shipment from being shipped across the seas to the United States before it leaves the actual export port. Uh, customs bond is another uh, active service of the uh, customs broker because all imports require a customs bond and that's a, a requirement of U.S. customs. And then also the importer of record registration. Uh, every, every company who wants to import into the United States, their EIN number needs to be registered as an active importer of record with customs. And quite often the customs broker will handle that for the importer as well. Do I need a customs broker? Not all businesses need to hire a broker. If you're involved in international trade, you may need a customs broker to help you navigate the regulations and the procedures for the customs clearance. And uh, the customs broker can help you comply with these regulations and ensure your goods are cleared for entry. Uh, common reasons to use a customs broker is if you're importing goods that have a value more than $2,500, if your goods are subject to a regulation by a other government agency such as FDA or USDA, EPA, there's, there's a slew of different types of government agencies and, and their, their requirement is all fulfilled through the customs entry. And then of course, importing goods for commercial purposes. You can clear customs yourself um, and, and through that, in, if you're importing personal effects such as clothing, jewelry, or furniture, and you can also import uh, yourself if your shipments are valued at less than $2,500 and you can clear that through customs. But if you're unsure what to do and you need to clear customs, I would suggest scheduling a consult with your licensed customs broker or a customs entry. They can advise you on the specific requirements for your, for your particular situation. The customs broker's qualifications. They say to become a licensed customs broker, it's like passing the bar exam. So uh, a customs broker should have the following qualifications. Licensed by US Customs, experienced in handling shipments similar to yours with proven success, knowledgeable about the regulations and procedures of customs clearances, a strong understanding of customs regulations and trade compliance, good communication skills, skills, and a commitment to provide high quality customer service. Be they should be familiar with specific regulations about your industry and able to provide expert guidance in navigating the customs clearance process. Every active custom broker must be licensed by US Customs after completing the customs broker license examination. And that examination tests on HTS codes, which is what Kim referred to uh, previously, the customs federal rules and regulations, that's a big book, uh, specific customs directives, uh, the CATER, which is the Customs and Trade Automated Interface Requirements Documented, and then they need to pass the exam, which the test takers must score at least 75%. And when someone becomes a licensed broker, they have a legal responsibility to provide accurate information and advice. And just so you know that to score at least 75%, the passing rate on this exam is about 5%. Back when I took it, it was a 1%. And I actually, I took two times. It, it's a difficult exam. So in order to achieve this, uh, it's a great, it's a great um, uh, honor. And um, there's a little prideful moment because you actually pulled it off. So how much does a customs broker cost? 
So when you're looking to hire a customs broker, you want to look at the amount the broker is charging for their service and, and examine that cost and what it would mean in potential mistakes for you. So for example, penalties for mistakes in your documents will far outweigh what you would pay for a customs broker. And, that, and that's pretty well what you not need to think about. And using a licensed custom broker give you, gives you access to experts who can confirm all legal requirements, submit documents electronically to customs for your customs clearance. Now customs bonds, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which is CBP, requires a customs bond, which is a binding contract for commercial imports valued at $2,500 or more. It acts as a financial guarantee between the importer record, which is you, and customs and the insurance surety company issuing the bond. And by obtaining a customs bond, it ensures that the relevant fees and import duties are paid to customs. Should your company fail to um, pay the customs duties, U.S. Customs will go after the surety company who posted the bond for you. Uh, so it's like a, in a car accident, they go out, they, you know, an, an issue is... Uh, I uh, cited with the, uh, the individual, but the insurance company um, takes matters to figure out the, uh, the financial settlement of that. And when do I need a customs bond? There's a number of situations when you need a bond, and they include when your imports are for commercial use and they're valued over $2,500. Remember I said, if it's less than $2,500, you don't even need a broker. Well, you don't need a customs bond either. And when your imported goods are required to meet federal regulations. So if they are a controlled product with uh, US Customs, uh, they will be required to have a customs bond. If the merchandise is subject to additional government agencies such as FDA, USDA, EPA, within those rules and regulations, the bond amount that it would cost you must be equal to three times the value of the shipment. Obviously, these are high priority uh, targets for US Customs and the other government agencies. So the value of the bond is uh, to represent the non-compliance penalties uh, should you be in that, in that situation. So you wanna think of the customs bond as a ticket you pay for your goods to gain entry in the United States. Before you purchase the bond, your imported goods will be held at customs and are pending approval until, until you show proof of that bond. So you need the bond to gain the final approval to release your goods. The surety companies are licensed by the U.S. Treasury Department to access import bonds, and a licensed customs broker will issue you a bond with a power of attorney from you, which gives the customs broker legal authority to file import entries on your behalf. And the import bonds are used by the customs broker to clear the goods. So when your customs broker is filing an entry for you at the border, and your goods are arriving or they have arrived from the freight forwarder at the port, um, the, uh, the, the customs broker will file the entry and then they will first check to see if you have a customs bond on file. How they do that within their system, because they're connected with U.S. Customs, they can run a query on your tax ID number, your EIN, and that EIN number query will come back and say whether you have a customs bond on file with customs. And it will also tell us whether you have registered your EIN with customs. So if you don't have a bond and you haven't, or you aren't active in their system, there's two things right off the bat that the customs broker will need to do for you. They'll need to activate your EIN and they'll also need to uh, arrange for you to obtain a customs bond. So you, when you purchase a customs bond, you're purchasing it basically at, at a $50,000 limit, and that's your minimum. That's not the cost of your, your bond. That's the, the amount of the insurance, the $50,000 insurance bond policy. 
the total cost will increase depending on the, your duty rates and the taxes that are paid for your import. And bonds are calculated to cover at least 10% of the duties and taxes collected by customs. The bonds cover all your shipments for the next 12 months. So if you import two to three times throughout the year, basically you'll have your bond paid for it and it'll, it'll you know and it'll be it'll be covered for all your shipments throughout 12 months and then requires a renewal after the 12 months if you decide to continue importing uh, sometimes importers just import a couple of times and they realize uh, this wasn't for me i had so much hardship i'm just going to give this a rest and maybe not do this that happens and uh, also, um, uh, you might shop around and uh, uh, upon the expiry of your bond, you might see if there's other customs brokers that uh, can pr provide a cheaper price for the same bond. There's no difference in service. It's all a minimum of a $50,000 bond. But like I said, the more, the higher the value of your shipment, the more duty you pay. So therefore your bond amounts could be higher than 50,000. And also when you're shipping uh, ocean, you also require to have a, a transaction bond for the import security filing. So your, your continuous bond, which is that 12 month bond, that will cover your, your customs entry bond, as well as your importer security bond requirement. So both of those are uh, combined and, and covered within that customs bond. So registering with customs as an importer, as I talked about, if you never imported before under your company name, this registration will need to occur. Um, and this happens in, uh, through the US customs uh, system. Uh, it's often uh, referred to as the importer registration. It, it can be handled by the customs broker and it activates your EIN for importing. And once it's uh, complete, the importers the importer will have an account with customs, be able to import goods. Once, once that's activated, if you don't import again for another two years, uh, customs will avoid it. And you'll have to do it again, just a FYI. The power of attorney. Uh, this is a, a legal document between your customs broker and yourself. And uh, US Customs requires all import, all customs brokers to obtain a, a power of attorney from you as the importer. And it's basically giving the customs broker the legal right to transact customs business on your behalf. And uh, it's considered customs business, so a power of attorney is required. And customs will audit the customs broker on a regular basis. Uh, and there's criteria in which they conduct their audit on. And one of them is to ensure a properly completed power of attorney is on file with the customs broker for each of the, um, the clients that they conduct business for. So documentation requirements, Kim talked a little bit about this. I'm not gonna go into detail, but this kind of breaks it down is, is for your commercial shipments um, for importing into the United States. These are primarily the four documents that customs brokers need to file the customs entry. The commercial invoice, which is basically prepared off, prepared from the bill of sale between yourself and your and the supplier that you purchase the goods from. And uh, the commercial invoice should represent, and theoretically, it should represent the purchase price that you, you purchase the goods from, a, 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 a very detailed product description. Customs need to be able to look at this commercial invoice and understand in detail what the product is being shipped. If it just has a part number, one, two, three, four, and it's called a widget, customs don't know what a widget is. So they need to know what the part name is, what it's a part for, that sort of thing. Also what's important on the commercial invoice is the, com is the country of origin. That a country of origin is not where the goods were shipped from. It's where the country was, sorry, where the product was manufactured. What country was it made in? So this, that is used in particular by US Customs to further assess customs duties. 
um, and to make sure all the information is accurate. A packing list is not necessarily a required document, but it is in certain commodities such as textiles, for example, it is very um, beneficial to have the supplier issue a packing list. And this is basically the outlining the dimensions, the contents, the net weight of each of the, the box, the package, the carton um, by container if you have multiple containers. Um, that way, if you get called for an exam by U.S. Customs and they want to pull one, a particular product, you know precisely what box that product is in uh, based on the packing list. So that makes life a lot easier. So the bill of lading, uh, that, that's a legal document that lists goods in the form of a receipt and outlines the details of those goods. It covers three main purposes. It's an official receipt that confirms your imports are loaded onto the vessel. Uh, it contains the terms of your contract, and it also is the official title for your goods. The bill of lading will have a, um, a bill of lading number assigned to it, and the customs entry that the U.S. broker completes will reference that same bill of lading. So you, as you can see, this all tucks and ties together. You have the commercial invoice where you have the value, the description, the country of origin, all that is presented to customs electronically by the customs broker. And then we reference in the bill of lading number, which ties that in as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Last thing, lastly on the documentation is a notice of arrival, otherwise known as arrival notice. That is an ish, an ish, ish, uh, that is issued by the carrier's agent to the consignee and basically says, these goods have arrived or will be arriving at this particular port on this day. And that gives the customs broker the permission to file the customs entry within that timeline. Uh, so the customs broker in theory cannot file the customs entry and present the documentation to customs requesting a customs clearance until the notice of arrival is obtained. Sometimes that notice of arrival can go directly to the customs broker as a second notify party on the bill of lading, but, in, but mainly the first notified party needs to be your company because it's, it's super important for you to receive that notice of arrival from the freight forwarder or the uh, steamship line. So that pretty well wraps up mine. Like Kim, I could go on forever, and, uh, but I won't. Um, and it certainly leads to other things that come to my mind that we could talk about in, in customs exams or and things like that. But I, I don't I didn't want to get too much into the weeds, just give you something highlighted and maybe we can turn uh, the next one into the what ifs and how do we handle that and the different programs. But again, there is so much to discuss and it all depends on what you want to learn. Um, so we offer services as well. Uh, I work for RNL Global Logistics. Uh, where our parent company is RNL Carriers, and uh, so we are a LTL carrier primarily. And this picture on the left is uh, Mr. Roberts himself back in 1965. Uh, when it all started with one man in a truck, it's an amazing story. He just recently passed. And it was a very sad day for us with the Roberts family uh, because he has grown this company. It's a family, a family owned and a family run business. And uh, so it's very flat and the Roberts family is very engaged in the business. I'm just honored to work for them and work with them and be part of that family. The RNL Global Logistics is the freight forwarding arm, the customs broker arm. We do full truckload, warehousing, all those other services outside of uh, domestic LTL trucking. And uh, so we fall under that umbrella, which um, is growing rapidly. So anyone have any questions pertaining to any of our services from a, a custom standpoint, we are a customs broker. I am a licensed customs broker, but the, our division is a licensed customs broker. And uh, we also offer compliance, um, 
auditing and reporting and consulting services to help your company to uh, do the right thing and save some money with duty and, and uh, try and take care of the compliance piece of your business. And, and that's about all I have to offer right now. And it's been great uh, presenting to you all and hopefully you have lots of questions and I really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much, Linda. Uh, I think you, what uh, people have heard from all three of our speakers is that information is important, uh, whether it uh, is the information that uh, needs to be provided to your supplier uh, when they're manufacturing for you or when you're buying your product, it's getting the right information to them, getting the right information to your freight forwarder so that uh, they can help you to get your product to the right place at the right time. Uh, and then of course, uh, and in many ways, most importantly to your customs broker, uh, one thing I, I would add is uh, don't lie. Uh, don't give complete and accurate information to your customs broker because you might think uh, you can pull a fast one on Uncle Sam and maybe you will once, but uh, if you ever get found out, as uh, Linda has said, uh, you know this is a this is a serious offense. It could cost you a lot of money. It could uh, even cost you uh, uh, time in jail. So. Uh, because of that, uh, you need to be sharing accurate information and truthful information uh, with uh, your customer broker because they're going to, all of these three are going to be great partners for it. So we're at the Q&A portion now. Uh, I see some in chat and I'll get to those ones as well, but there's uh, one left uh, from an anonymous attendee asking what requires a bond and how is the amount calculated? I think you've gone over pretty well uh, since that question was posed as to what requires a bond, but um, roughly how much does it cost for a bond? And is um, having, you know, a, a cat like providing cash. So if you had a $50,000 bond, can you provide 50,000 cash if you want to avoid uh, uh, any costs associated with paying uh, for a bond? Uh, uh, are you able to help with that, Linda? Yeah. So a bond, it can vary, but um, uh, a bond is typically around $500 for one year, right? And, and that's for a $50,000 bond. Now, if, like I said, if uh, you have a, a product that is uh, more of a trade controlled product and the risk is higher, then the bond would be higher. Or if you import, um, um, more shipments than two to three, four, five times a year, you may need a higher bond. The bond is available through by the customs broker and they, they align themselves with the surety company. And um, what was the last part of that, Chris? Was uh, uh, Just whether you can come up with uh, a cash, uh, like oh, if you want to just have 50,000 cash. Sent yeah, there. typically um, you, you, you don't want to, come up with the cash. The cash is just, it's its a credit check. Now, if you have anti-dumping duties and countervailing duties um, uh, on your products, the surety bond may require you to post collateral uh, because that's those are higher risk um, bond uh, insurers for them. So that collateral would be cash where you put a lien and such, but, uh, and eventually you'll get that back. But uh, you, 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 you don't want to um, put that as a cash or a check kind of withdraw against, against your, your company. It's just basically a credit check saying that you're good for $50,000 in credit. Thank you. Uh, Lee Scarlett asked whether R&L provides a PDF of all this info and uh, we will be sharing a copy of the presentation uh, with you as well as the contact information for Linda. Uh, my good friend, Mary Robbins up in Jacksonville has asked Joe whether Atlantic Logistics also handles LCL cargo and airport pickups. Thanks, Chris. Uh, absolutely. We have, uh, we have drivers that service uh, the ports, the air, uh, airports. Um, we also do the uh, the uh, intermodal pickups at the different rail hubs. 
So yes, we can handle uh, the LCL that's uh, that's uh, directed into an airport. Thanks. Uh, Christina has asked for confirmation that the customs bo broker provides the bond. Yes. Excellent. Correct. I'm just going scrolling down through here. Uh, let's see, Jorge Vento has asked, I think this is probably one for Kim. If you buy from China, if the merchant will be in USA as transit because it will be exporting. Uh, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I just, that I just asked him okay. to clarify, but I, okay. I can answer real quickly. Basically, if there are, if he's talking about the US company, the US company is importing the product into the United States, typically. So your company is the importer, then you're typically responsible for paying customs duties, fees, tariffs, you know, anything um, that's related to that. And the du customs duties are taxes in, at the end of the day. Um, so yes, you're responsible for paying that. There are very, very infrequently are there export duties or taxes that have to be paid out of China. If they do exist, they're relatively small amounts, um, mostly processing fees. And it depends on how you structure the purchase that would be in your purchase order and any agreement that you have. Are you going to take ownership of the goods when they leave the factory? In which case, you know, you probably are going to pay for all those exporting costs. Are you only going to take ownership when they arrive in the United States? In which case, the factory would pay for the exporting costs. So that's all part of the discussion you have with the supplier. Who's going to pay for what? What point do you take ownership? What are you responsible paying for? What are they responsible paying for? Thanks, Kim. Uh, we've got another question here, and I think I know the answer to all of these, but I'll ask you each individually. And that was whether you are all nationwide with your services. So maybe Kim, then Joe, then uh, Linda. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, we, we. And Joe? Definitely, yes. Excellent. Uh, one question I wanted to put, and this could really be to any of you, is what is the advantage and disadvantage of having a supplier that's going to ship right to your door. Uh, obviously there's going to be, that's an advantage from the perspective of, uh, you don't have to worry much about shipping, but uh, why might you as an importer want to do the shipping uh, yourself or you look after the customs broker yourself? Uh, maybe Joe? Yeah, that's me, Joe and I. Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think it's more directed for you, Linda, because uh, okay. it's you're 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 looking at the, the actual conveyance of the product to the shipper directly, right? Oh, I'm yeah, talking about is just having looking after Drops having the whole transaction looked after by um, shipper. a shipper provided by or a freight forwarder provided by the supplier, um, because obviously there's there's great convenience, but then you know is there a downside to having them do that? There is. Uh, it's definitely a convenience and, and I understand and it's a great question, Chris, because we, we deal a lot with this question as well. Um, it, it's definitely a convenience, but what what we don't know is what we don't know. So when you're Chinese, uh, let's say you're using China, for example. So when your Chinese supplier is finding a Chinese freight forwarder um, and they're shipping it directly to you, you don't know what's being declared to customs because you're not privy to any of that information. Uh, so you don't know what's being declared. You don't know if it's being classified properly. Uh, you don't know how much duty was being paid, but what you do know is you're getting a bill for, for, for purchasing the goods for let's say a unit cost of $5 each. Well, your freight charges are included in that as well as any duty that the, um, uh, was declared when the goods entered into the United States. All those charges are being passed on to you through your unit price. Uh, 
Uh, so you're really paying for that in the end. So why not book the freight with Joe, for example, and, and perform the customs clearance yourself so you can manage those landed costs uh, when, so you know everything, how it's priced that goes into your goods. And then you'll know whether you can find a better deal. And then you could say to your supplier, okay, I just want to purchase the widgets and that's all. And they give you the widgets for $2. Another thing is when you're using a freight forwarder yourself and you're, you're paying for that service, you get full visibility of that freight. Um, and you lose that when you rely on your supplier to ship it. You don't know where it is, when it's gonna arrive. It just shows up at your door. And maybe you need an appointment to show up for the delivery. And maybe um, it's they wanna deliver on a weekend and you're not open, you know? So that tracking and tracing visibility is gone when you don't control the freight as well. Excellent. Uh, we've got a question from Caroline Faust, whether each product you import needs its own bond and paperwork, for example, for shampoos, creams, gels, uh, for body, co coconut uh, oil, et cetera. Yeah, good question. So those products are all regulated by FDA. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, anything that is regulated by another government agency um, ha has a higher bond rate for it, but you don't need a bond for every product. You, you as a company, as an importer, you, you just need a customs bond and it would cover all the goods that you'll import in, in the next 12 months. We also have a question from Natasha Jordan, whether any of the companies provide storage for the product once it comes into the country. <laughs> Um, I'll just take a quick stab at that one in terms of that's in many ways what makes a third party logistics company the third party logistics because they're doing everything for you. They're not only your freight forwarder who is moving your product and getting it to destination, but they'll also help with storage and potentially with distribution as well. There's also companies that will help you. Uh, do fulfillment and will store the product for you as well. When we've done similar ones in the past, uh, we've had someone come in and talk about how they can do your fulfillment for you. So there's real, always going to be someone who can help with this. You don't have to worry about storing things in your garage and going down the post office every time you need to have uh, an order shipped. Uh, you can have someone do that for you. And I think you also might find it's surprising uh, because of their uh, greater bargaining power that it may end up not costing you all that much more than doing everything yourself uh, and you don't have to be uh, be bothered with it. It might even actually cost you less because they can get better shipping rates than you can. So that just off gets offset with storage and uh, makes it very convenient for running a business. And then there's, of course, services like Amazon, uh, uh, which will do your distribution as well. And uh, that involves your storage. So really it, uh, there's always going to be someone uh, willing to be paid to do things and take it off uh, uh, your shoulders. Uh, it's just uh, a matter as to whether your uh, business model and pricing is going to uh, make that economically feasible. But uh, that's what we're here for. People like Joe and Kim and Linda and myself, and uh, of course, our friends at SCORE is for helping connect you to, um, to the services and make you aware of them uh, that uh, you don't have to have to do this alone. Uh, and with that, I think we're at 1045. So we've uh, gone past our one hour mark. Uh, Lois has been incredibly generous with us and uh, no problem. Down, but we're always here to answer more questions uh, uh, that you might have. The, the thoughts that I would like to leave you with is it's lonely being an entrepreneur. And I don't want you to think that you're out there by yourself. You see great resources here. Chris at the NEC is always ready to step up. And he has partners everywhere that he can bring in when he needs specific support. Reach out to your SCORE office you guys are coming in from all over the country. So the emails are very simple, score.org slash, and then the, the city or county that your score is in. They can help you as well. Watch for the recording in a few days. 
Chris will be sending a follow-up email with all of the decks, but be sure that you reach out and don't try to do this alone. And I would like to thank you guys on, on the screen for joining us today. Here is my tech service who's been calling on me all day. <laughs> so with that, I will leave you guys and I will see you on the next one. Thanks.